Hi, I'm Damien Humphreys. I'm Luke Hindmarsh. And we are... In Deep Crit. Good morning, welcome back to The Pit of Crit. And this morning we are looking at the Druid class for Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Uh, starting with an overview of the, the basic Druid, that every Druid will, the abilities that every Druid will get. And then looking at the two subclasses presented in the Player's Handbook. Uh, so first of all, as a druid, um, some of your class features, uh, hit dice are 1d8 uh, per druid level, you are a full spellcaster um, with wisdom as your spellcasting ability, um, so your um, attack, your spell save DC is 8 plus your proficiency bonus, um, plus your wisdom modifier, and your spell attack modifier is your proficiency bonus plus your wisdom modifier. You can prepare any spells from the Druid spell list, and you can change those after a long rest. Um, you get the same number of spell slots as any of the, the other full casters, um, and you can prepare Druid spells um, equal to a number equal to your Wisdom modifier plus your Druid level per day. And you are also a Ritual caster, so if a spell has the Ritual tag and you have it prepared, you may cast that spell as a Ritual. Vital to mention you may not wear armour or use shields made of metal because it's unnatural. But you can use weapons made of metal because that's fine. Because, <laughs> because reasons. And, and also metal doesn't come out of the ground and isn't a part of the natural world. It's just magically good. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> so uh, <laughs> should we move on from that issue? Uh, on, yes. uh, so, look, I mean, we, we could do a breakdown of the skills and saving throws and all that, but we we, we've tried to sort of gloss over those in previous videos. You've probably got the book. What, what's interesting about druids? Well, you get the language of druids known as druidic, which, hmm, hey, it's pretty cool. Like Thieves can, it could be very useful, can be very thematic, can be really something that you, as a player, can encourage uh, with your DM if you're going to say, well, I want to leave messages in druidic, I want to try and uh, give signs to people uh, who look like they might be natural wanderer types who could be druids, and encourage that. But it I think we, we probably said this is more of a, a, a DM tool. Um, nice for building in uh, the feeling of a bigger campaign world uh, if you use it, obviously, so your mileage may vary. Um, that probably brings us on to this defining trait of the Druid, Wild Shape, um, which I mean, I'll just quickly cover, yeah. if that's okay. So in, in, in essence, from the second level, you can spend an action to assume the shape of a beast you have seen before not enough to smell it or hear it you have to have seen it uh you get to use that twice um uh per short rest so you can recover it from a short rest or a long rest and um your level determines what kind of shape you can assume and it's all to do with what your the maximum um cr is so if at second level you're, you're looking at a you know, challenge rating of a quarter uh fourth level challenge rating of a half eighth level and above challenge rating of one and that's where it, it stays unless you're a certain uh, subclass which we'll get into later uh, you can stay in the beast shape for a number of hours equal to half your druid level rounded down uh, and then revert to your normal form uh, unless you expend your other use of the feature um, you can also as a bonus action revert uh, earlier than that if you fall unconscious drop to zero hit points or die you automatically uh, revert um, and there's some Shall I switch over to you so you can talk about those further rules? How about sure, that? yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it's um, just my voice droning. <laughs> so the, the other limitations on your shapes are at second level, you can have no flying or swimming speed in the beast shape you're in. At fourth level, you gain a swimming speed, but still no flying speed. And at eighth level, you can transform into a creature, into a beast that has either um, flying or swimming speed, if, if you wish. Um, while you're transformed, your game statistics are replaced by the statistics of the beast, apart from your alignment and your personality, and you also keep your intelligence, wisdom, and charisma scores. You keep, you keep all of your skills and saving throw proficiencies, in addition to gaining those of the creature. Um, and if you have the same proficiency as the creature, so you've both got perception, you use whichever, whichever one is higher for that for that particular ability that particular skill um the creature doesn't 
you don't get any legendary or lair actions if the creature has them. They're unlikely to have them at those challenge ratings, to be fair. Um, you assume all of the beasts hit points and hit dice. And then when you revert to your normal form, you return to the number of hit points you had before you transformed. However, if the damage that you take in beast form takes you past zero hit points, the extra damage is carried over into your normal form. Um, so the example they give is if you take 10 damage in animal form, animal form but only have one hit point left, that extra nine damage gets carried over into your normal form. And as long as um, the excess damage doesn't reduce your normal form to zero hit points, you are not unconscious. You can't cast spells. And your ability to speak or take any action that requires hands is limited to capabilities of your beast form. But transforming does not break your concentration on a spell you've already cast or prevent you taking actions that are passed to that part of that spell. So if you've already cast Call Lightning, you can still continue to Call the Lightning whilst in your beast form. You retain any benefit of the features from your class race or other source um, and can use them if the new form is physically capable of doing so. However, you can't use any of your special senses, such as dark vision, unless your new form also has those. And you choose whether your equipment falls to the ground in your space, merges into your new form, or is worn by it. Worn equipment is up, that's up DM's DM fiat, essentially. Um, DM decides whether it's sensible that this beast can be wearing and or using that equipment um, based on its size and shape, um, because the equipment does not change size or shape to match the new form. Um, any equipment that merges with a new form has no effect until you leave that form. And I think that covers wild shape. It does. Uh, now we've got uh, Tasha's um, cauldron of everything. There's an additional optional feature. We, did, we haven't gone into the fact that there are additional class spells. We have done a video about uh, druids in Tasha's, but the important one to mention here is that you get this wild companion option, which effectively uses your uses of uh, wild shape instead to basically cast fine familiar which has some of the limitations um, some more limitations than the normal spell it only lasts again like your wild shape um, for half your druid level rounded it's rounded it doesn't say it's rounded down it presumably is rounded down um yeah yeah no it, yes yes it doesn't say it but it is but it is because that's standardly how 5e does it. doesn't follow the rules of mathematics. It follows its own rules. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you don't have to have a material component to cast Find Familiar. So it's potentially rather useful if you, you know, don't want to be the one who goes prowling about on behalf of the party. You don't really want to turn into something small and squishy because you want to be turning into a bear, um, if you can, or something. Maybe if you, you can't reach that level, at least you don't want to be turning into a spider or something so instead you send out this familiar that's temporary um what else are we looking at with uh druids well at that point um you get your druid circle also at second level and that of course comes into the subclasses and shall i just quickly cover ability scores as well of yeah. course you've got your asis at fourth level eighth twelfth sixteenth and nineteenth um they're all standard but remember now thanks to tasha cauldron of everything there is this additional option to uh have cantrip versatility so you can then switch out one of those druid cantrips that you've already got when you realize that you haven't got druid craft and it's extremely important that you know what the weather is um so that's that option um, and then over to you with time i think it's timeless yeah, body time, next timeless body so we could uh, all with all do with one of those indeed uh, 18th level um the primal magic and your connection with the natural world causes you to age more slowly. So for every 10 years that pass, your body ages only one year, which um, yeah, I, I think I could do with this morning, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> I've already gone through this. That's why I've got the mental age of like a... How much that... <laughs> anyway, sorry. <clears throat> how much that comes into your campaign depends on how much you use aging in your campaign, I would guess. Um, it's a bit of a throwback to earlier editions, isn't it? Where it is more bit, creatures yeah. could age you magically. It's not impossible for that to happen, but it's, it's less... Anyway, we're not reviewing yeah. it, we're just... No. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, 18th level, you gain the Beast Spells ability, so you can now cast many of your Druid spells in any shape you assume using Wild Shape. You can perform somatic and verbal components of Druid spell whilst in a Beast Shape, but you aren't able to provide material components. Um... I would assume you can still use the spellcasting focus. 
But if it's a particularly specifically listed material component with a cost, you probably can't use it. You're you're a nice DM. You would let players do that, whereas I'm yeah. a DM, and I would just be like, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I don't know. I don't know. I can't. I probably go with, agree with you that uh, as, if it's not a specific material component that's lost as a result, and you need to have a diamond worth whatever, uh, then you know it's just it's just an unnecessary restriction. Um, yeah. Are you leaving me to talk about the capstone? Indeed. Because it's a big weighty. So brace yourselves. This is the long, long bit. At a twentieth level, you can use your wild shape an unlimited number of times. You can, that's not a bad one. Uh, bye bye. Then we're we're done with giving the, the general overview. And we'll be back with subclasses. So the bird circle presented in the player's handbook for druids is the circle of the land. Uh, mystics and sages um, safeguarding the ancient knowledge, um, meeting in secret stone circles, um, the kind of communities of the faiths of the old world, um, keeping the, the evil from destroying the natural world. Uh, the first ability that you're going to get with, when you make this choice at second level is a bonus cantrip. So you learn one additional druid cantrip of your choice. Which has to be druid craft. I mean, that's not the rule, <laughs> but that's... Um, then at second level you get natural recovery, which is a bit like arcane recovery if you've ever played a wizard and you're wanting to translate that across to being a druid. But if you haven't and you want that explained, in, a sen in essence you can um, regain some magical energy by meditating and communing with nature. How you do that is, of course, just a matter of role playing. So during a short rest, you choose expended spell slots to recover, and they can have a combined level that is equal to or less than half your druid level rounded up. So For a just, to, just just to confuse you. Now, anyway, um, none of the slots can be sixth level or higher. You can't use the feature uh, until you finish a long rest. So you get one use of this per long rest, and it occurs when you have a short rest just to be complicated. Yes. Um, the example it gives is when you're a fourth level druid, you can recover up to two levels worth of spell slots, which could be a second level slot or two first level slots. So I hope that's clear. Indeed. And you also gain circle spells. Um, so you won't gain any of these at second level. The earliest you gain them is at third level. Um, but your mystical connection to the land gives you these abilities with, with certain spells. Um, and any of those spells become druid spells for you if they're not on the druid spell list um, and they're always prepared and they don't count against the number of spells that you can prepare each day uh, so they're, they're extra spells that, that you always know always have handy and that depends on the land type that you have chosen for your for your origin essentially um, and those those choices are arctic coast desert forest grassland mountain swamp or the underdark um, and there's those lists of associated spells for those. I'm not going to go through them all. Um, there's a there's quite a few on there that are already on the druid spell list, but just mean you will always have prepared. Um, and there's some on there that aren't. Um, you know, we were talking beforehand, and we picked out kind of um, forest is very much, nearly much. I think all on the druid spell list. Um, Pretty much. Gra grassland is good because you're gaining things like haste, um, swamp, Melfus Acid Arrow, uh, scrying later on, underdark, you're getting spider climb, web, gases form, stinking cloud, greater invisibility. Um, there's some, I, I think some of them are better choices than others. Um, yeah. But Mirror Image and Misty Step on, on the coast list at third level are, are nice additions to the Druid spell list. This is a choice to make when you are when you know what the campaign's about, perhaps. That's why it's yeah. quite nice it's occurring at second level. You're not having to anchor yourself to a particular land. I suppose, given the rules of changing um, your subclass within Tasha's, whether or not your DM might allow you to be flexible and change what land, that's going to be an individual choice. I'm not sure it's baked into the rules itself. Yeah. Um, I would have thought that might have been something they put in the, specifically in Tasha's, but they haven't um, no. for Druids. Um, 
So that takes us on to the sixth level ability, a Land's Stride, where non-magical difficult terrain costs you no extra movement. Uh, it doesn't help the rest of your party, so this may not be hugely useful for you over land, um, although if you're taking some kind of scouting role in a particular wild shape, it might be very useful. Um, but of course, potentially very helpful if you've got a more complex uh, battle type situation. Um, in addition, um, you can also pass through non-magical plants without being slowed by them or taking damage if they have thorns, vines or a similar hazard. It can be clutch, I think is what we say. Um, and finally, you have advantage on saving throws against plants that are magically created or manipulated to impede movement. So obviously the, the example they use is Entangle. There are a few others uh, in, in, the, in the spell lists. Um, again, any effects here? Yes. So at 10th level, you get Nature's Ward. Um, so you can now can no longer be charmed or frightened by elementals or fae, and you are immune to poison and disease. And, and then, then the capstone. Yes, sorry. <laughs> capstone at 14th level for uh, druids is Nature's Sanctuary. So when a beast or plant creature attacks you, it's got to make a wisdom saving throw against your druid spell save DC. And on a failed save, it has to choose a different target or its attack automatically misses. Uh, if it saves successfully, it's immune from your nature sanctuary for 24 hours. Um, uh, the creature is aware of the effect before it makes its attack against you. So in other words, that's giving the, the, making it easier on the DM where some abilities, the DM should be pl perhaps playing that attack um, because the creature would have no way of knowing this issue. Uh, the, you know, you, you, you then gain the benefit of it missing out on uh, its attack roll. Uh, but the creature knows because, and it is in the fluff here, that um, it senses your connection to nature and so is therefore hesitant to attack you. What do we think about this subclass, Damien? Uh, this, so this is this is your your support caster druid, right? This is your your spell casting druid, very much focused on on the spell casting aspect of the class, um, with the, the addition of the extra spells, um, depending on your on your land that you have chosen. Uh, yeah, but I, I, like I said, the, the spells are the spells are pretty good. I think there's a good, there's some good additions to to the spell list there and. Some nice ones to have in the druid spell list that you then don't need to prepare that you always yeah. have ready. Um, interestingly, none of the curing spells are on there. No cure wounds or anything are on there. Um, so that's still very much, <coughs> excuse me, I guess in the domain of the cleric um, more than the druid. Yeah, and, I mean, it, it's, it's very front loaded, isn't it? This this yes, subclass in terms yeah. of. Um, you know, most of your cool stuff is happening early on. Some of the later abilities are—I mean, they're not useless. They're, no. I know, there's nothing but good things to say about those spell selections. If you know whether, if, I mean, if you're going to be uh, at sea a lot, taking coast is obvious. If you're going to be in the underdark a lot, that, that's going to be very helpful, I should think. Yeah. But if you don't know, then some of them are indeed better than others. I'm, we're not going to give a breakdown now, but we will do a druid uh, bonus spell. Uh, video at some point and, and I'm sure you can pick out from that maybe we'll mention what our preferred land is in that maybe we won't but we'll be able to see what spells we like for druids and you can think about whether or not they're up there permanently prepared or, or otherwise yeah. but um, land stride I mean it's it's okay it's it fits nothing. the theme right if it fits the theme of, of yes. a druid um, being able to move through through non different through non-magical difficult terrain, being able to move through, you know, um, growths of briars and thorns and that kind of thing without without taking damage or being slowed down. Um, yeah, so I, I quite like the imagery of it. It's sort of you're going through the briar patch and it, the, the briars are actually melting out of your way a little bit before they close back behind yeah, you because you're a part of them almost. I, gives, I mean, it gives me a very cool. Herman the Hunter kind of vibe, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Nice Robin of Sherwood reference and if you don't know what Robin of Sherwood is shame on you go and look at it it doesn't matter how old it is it's awesome um, anyway it, it's it's a uh, yeah I mean I, I think it's also very useful so it from a t 
tactical perspective. Landstride works very nicely, being the spell slinger or spell support uh, character that you are as a land circle of the land druid, because you're not going to be able to be controlled or blocked in your movements so effectively. Yeah. Um, off the top of my head, oh, I should have looked at this before the video, do you remember whether Entangle affects the caster? Probably does, doesn't it? Are you immune to tang Entangle? Um... If we can't remember that off the top of our heads, uh, maybe you can tell us. But if it, a, if a you're creature not immune... in the area when you cast a spell must succeed on the strength saving throw. Um, so, so yes, I, it, well, I assume it would. It doesn't say that you're immune from your own spell. Much like getting trapped by the sleep spell. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> which has happened. <laughs> um, not not to me, glad. So, but but enta so entangle is going to affect everyone, but it's not going to yeah. affect you. Or rather, you've got advantage on a save. Okay. Advantage, yeah. Advantage. So it still could affect you, but nonetheless, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, what do you think of nature's ward? Isn't that just like... So the, the not being charmed by or frightened by elementals or fae, cool if elementals and fae are coming up in the campaign a lot. Um, yeah, cool. Um, but that's... immune to poison and disease, I think, is... That's that's the, the sentence there that that really fills me with joy for, for this ability. Um, yes. Because it just says immune to poison, so I read that as immune to poison damage and the poisoned effect. Poison status effect. So, yes. yeah, bring it on. I mean, that's the way it's written. Uh, yeah. I appreciate that sometimes they like to reinterpret what they've written because they haven't edited it properly. <laughs> so there might be somewhere where they've said, actually, this is not what it means. Uh, but it's the way it's written, for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, hey, this is less useful in Curse of Strahd, for example. Um, but, yeah. but hey, very useful if, you know, elementals and, and fey are present and immune, poison and disease. Great. Being immune to disease when you're coming up against that mummy, very useful. Indeed. Yeah. Nature Sanctuary is just, I mean, as a capstone, it's... A uh, <laughs> 14th level, how many beasts <laughs> are that worrying? Plant creatures, shambling mounds, I don't know how threatening they are, yeah. really. Not, not that many, I think. Um, I guess it saves an annoyance against those those plant and beast minion types, right? Um, it does what it says on the tin, Nature Sanctuary. It's essentially a permanent sanctuary effect against beasts and plants. Um, yes, for you. It's not, yeah. it's not awe-inspiring as a capstone, but this subclass... And I think... I think the Druid in general is quite front-loaded in its abilities. Certainly um, within the player's handbook. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, I give this good crit. Yeah. I, it's, so it doesn't... Does it make the Druid into this must-play uh, character class if it isn't already? Maybe you already think it is. I, I don't think it does, so therefore it's not the crit for me. But, but it's very strong. It's very potent if you want to be playing that caster type druid uh so yeah. it is indeed yeah it's good crit it, it doesn't doesn't weaken being a druid in any way it doesn't detract only adds no it adds it, good it, stuff it so. adds good stuff to the spell casting side of the druid next up is circle of the moon oh. i feel like i should oh I feel like <laughs> I feel like I should break into uh, some kind of uh, Credence Clearwater revival skit where we do that. I feel, like I but if I if I do that, we might not be able to put the video up uh, for to, to more than one reason. Um, just, just don't rage quit on hearing me sing. Uh, Circle of the Moon. So, I mean, yeah, there's some spiel about it being you know fierce guardians of the wilds, but this just plays into my werewolf fantasy. Uh, for me, yeah. maybe it's different for you. Or wear bear. Let's face it, it's going to be a possibility. And um, you know, you you get some heavily focused on wild shape abilities. And the mm. first of those that you get at second level is combat wild shape. You gain the ability to use wild shape on your turn as a bonus action rather than as an action. And additionally, whilst you are transformed by wild shape, you can use a bonus action to expend a spell slot. To regain 1d8 hit points per level of the spell slot expended. And obviously you can see how that might scale. Um, yes, indeed. Also, at second level, when you choose this circle, um, you can transform into a more dangerous animal forms. So you can now transform into a beast with a challenge rating as high as 1. 
Um, so you ignore the max CR rating in the column of a B-shaped table. You've got to abide by the other limitations, so still no um, flying speed or swimming speed until the, the relative levels. And then at sixth level, you can transform into a beast with a challenge rating as high as your druid level, divided by three, rounded down. And that brings us on to sixth level, where you get primal strike, and short, long and short of it, effectively makes your attacks magical. Yeah, in beast form. Yeah, you're, in, you're beast, in beast form, sorry, yes. Yeah. True. <clears throat> uh, tenth level, elemental wild shape. Um, so you can expend two uses of wild shape, so both of your uses of wild shape at the same time to transform into an air elemental, earth elemental, a fire elemental, or a water elemental. And the capstone ability, thousand forms. Uh, so at fourteenth level, you can use alter self, the spell, at will. Yeah. Um, Thoughts and wow. feelings. Yes, I mean th th <laughs> this is this is this is just uh, this is a subclass that makes you want to howl because it's uh, so good, isn't it? Um, yeah. I mean, this this is rather completely re sort of rearranging what the druid is to. Hey, spells. Yeah, I mean, you can still cast them, but let's face it, this is turning you to an absolute beast in combat, I mean, yeah. really. Um, we, we looked up what the kind of first, so at second level, what could you be? And it was a brown bear, wasn't it, with like 34 yeah. hit points? Yeah, a, a brown bear, 34 hit points, two attacks. Uh, yeah. So, and with a, with a bonus action, so I can transform, I can use my bonus action to transform into a brown bear, and then immediately use my action to make two attacks. Um... Doing uh, doing a decent amount of damage actually. Um, I've got it here. So one d eight plus four piercing damage, and two d six plus four slashing damage with the claws, both with a plus six to hit. <laughs> it's tasty. Strength of nineteen. So even out of combat, you know, we need to lock down that door. Bosh. Bosh. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. This um, the, and. Yeah, going on with the circle forms at higher levels, you know, so by the time you're, you're kind of ninth level, you're in a CR3 creature, uh, beast, um, you can, as long as you've seen it, remember, it's still a, the other limitation applies that you must have seen the beast before, so you can't suddenly become a triceratops if you've never seen one. You have to have seen the beast. Now, what? Here's an interesting thing. What if you have seen it as an illusion, or a, in a dream, or <laughs> I mean, this is so obviously there's some. Yeah. You need to have a chat with your DM about exactly what the limitation means in their campaign. Yes. You spent a lot of time researching a particular creature. Does that count? No. Well, maybe it does. I mean, it depends maybe on it your does, DM. But yeah. well, I, 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 I would think you actually have to have encountered one at, at least physically. That's seen. yeah. Uh, I, I guess that would be my ruling on it. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, in a certain campaign, if I had taken this option, I could potentially at some point become a um, a, a sea-based dinosaur, and I'll say no more than that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Pretty awesome. Indeed. I'm not sure, not sure it would be very useful, but I would just be like, <laughs> I'm not getting out of the water, man. I am this thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> being able to have your uh, wild-shaped attacks being counting as magical it's yeah. tasty so that's removing the limitation that otherwise wild shape for me i see wild shape as like it's useful early on as a survivable surviving survival tool then it sort of drifts and becomes less and less useful standardly but the, by the time that happens the already awesome selection that you've got for uh yeah. being circle of the moon you're getting the elemental wild shape and those elementals are Okay, they're not necessarily the strongest or best creature you could possibly ever turn into. They're pretty tasty at tenth level. Pretty, yeah, um, pretty tasty indeed. Um, yeah, this this keeps it relevant. This keeps the wild shape relevant. So it uses both uses of your wild shape, but by tenth level, that's you know you can stay in that shape for five hours. <laughs> so yeah. uh, quite a long time. Um, yeah. And so you get you get the hit points of the elemental, and you get the the attacks and the and the, the special attacks. But you also get all of those juicy immunities, 
you know, so oh, you yeah. get some damage immunities, you get some damage resistances, a load of condition resistances. <clears throat> you know, you suddenly become much more difficult to take out of combat. Yeah. And then <sighs> 14th level capstone is a bit, but yeah. it's so good before that. I mean, there's something wrong with having all to self at will. That's kind of fun. Uh, very good for role playing. But in yeah. terms of its use, otherwise, okay, it's not outstanding. It's far from your greatest ability. Um, but then again, as we've said, druids in the player's handbook, at least, their subclasses are very much front loaded. Very front loaded. And yeah. certainly nothing to sniff at. This, 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 sub, this subclass is. Like, you know, you're playing alongside someone who's a barbarian and they think they've got all the hit points, and you're like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> you've got weird points this is an amazing subclass oh uh, this is this is the crit without doubt this is, this is right up there um yeah i so i haven't played a druid in fifth edition uh if i were to play one um maybe one of the other ones that we'll come on to in another video but this i think would be my go-to choice um just that you know a second level Suddenly being able to have 34 hit points and two attacks, which, you know, triple the hit points of anybody else in the party. Nobody else is getting two attacks. Okay, you just attack, you, you got the bonus action attack, I, I guess. Um, but nobody else is getting two attacks as an action until fifth level, you know, at the earliest. So, yeah, um, this is absolutely the crit. It makes me question. So that ability in itself maybe explains why you can't wear metal armour. Because then, like, you can't, yeah. burst, you'd have to burst out of it. But then again, you don't burst out of your other armor; it just drops to the ground. I mean, I, I, I could see some scope for some house rules about how druids constantly have to restitch their clothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but hey, that's me. I, yeah, it's the crit. I, I love it. I think it's an amazing subclass. Um, when you eventually kill my warlock in Icewind Dale, I shall be taking my backup character is uh, Circle of the Moon. And the only reason I didn't go with it as my first choice uh, and so went with the warlock is because I hadn't played a warlock particularly um, and I fancied trying that out so yeah it's the crit. yeah a couple more sessions you'll be able to play a druid <laughs> Saturday Saturday it is he's Marvelous. not joking either anyway <laughs> if you've played these druid subclasses, you yeah. disagree with us and tell us actually we're, we're just completely misreading Circle of the Moon and that it's really not very good. Uh, then, then by all means disagree <laughs> and let us know. Um, and uh, we'd love to have the chat with you about it. Yeah, I'd love to hear from, from you on your thoughts on, on various wild shapes, which wild shape you prefer, um, non-combat uses, you know, um, when is a really good use of wild shape that you've come across in your games or used in your games. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Until then. Until next time.